So this morning we're starting a new series called Lessons from the Wise, and we are in Matthew, the second chapter, and it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. If you watch the news for even a couple of weeks, you're probably going to see evidence of some unbelievable force that's wreaking unbelievable havoc. Uh, maybe you've witnessed the images of hurricanes that seem to cause cities to drown before our very eyes. Or maybe you've seen um, earthquakes that shake not only the, the superstructures, but the infrastructures of our nation. Or maybe you've seen these uh, unbelievable fires that have just raged throughout California, destroying homes, taking lives, and leveling thousands of acres of forest. And we're awestruck by the incredible power that is unleashed in those horrific events. But I would like to suggest to you today that there is a power that unleashes more destructive ability than all of those combined, and that is the force of apathy or passivity. Just simply failing to take action can cause things to disintegrate and die in ways that we can't possibly appreciate. If you take no action in your education, either applying for a school or applying yourself in the school, it just sets a trajectory for your life that is so much less than it could have been. Or if you take no action on friendships. I listened to this great story from a young man this last uh, week. He said that he went to a college and it was an absolute horrific experience for him. He had no friends there. And he transferred to another college, and he made all kinds of friends there. And somebody asked him, were the people just friendlier at the second college? And he said, no. He said, I made it my responsibility to introduce myself to every person in my dormitory and every person in my class. And I found out I made some great friends. So just taking action towards that. If, if we just wait for friendships to develop, it doesn't really work. Or once we have friends, it takes some time and effort to keep those friendships going. Or how about work? Maybe you don't expand your skills or seek opportunities or your family. Uh, it's amazing how many people wait until something becomes a crisis before they do anything about it. Well, there's this concept of apathy, and it brings up a very important religious uh, debate and, uh, it, and by the way, this is not just within Christianity. This is, religions around the world tend to, to struggle with this concept. And the first concept is, is it true that everything depends on us? Like, is, it, is it my actions and, and my efforts that make the complete difference in my life and maybe in the world around me? Or the second model of that, and that, that's, you know, you're completely in charge the second model of that is God is doing everything and we're just kind of spectators to his activity. And here's what I want you to know. There's a lot of debate over is it the sovereignty of God or is it the free will of man? And here's what you should be aware of. Anytime we pick and choose between those two things, we get into trouble. It's actually an embracing of both those things. That there are things that God does and there are things we need to respond to that he does. That's so wise people take initiative in life. Wise people take initiative in life. We're, we're going to learn this lesson from the Magi. And the Magi, who, who are these people? Well, they're in the Christmas story. If you believe the carol, the Christmas carol, it says that we three kings 
uh, of Orient are. And uh, so a lot of people believe there were three wise men. We actually don't know that. The Bible doesn't tell us how many wise people there were. There could have been two. There could have been ten. We have no idea how many there were. Um, the Bible doesn't say how many they were. The Bible, if, if you want to learn more about this group of people, you have to dig pretty deep into Scripture and into ancient history. So the Magi were a group of people. They were a priestly class that lived about 700 years or were formed 700 years before the birth of Christ. And uh, they, uh, they were known as uh, a priestly class who were committed to very deep levels of education. So they were very well versed in math, in science, in, uh, uh, um, in the supernatural. They were interested in all those things. And in fact, a lot of people believe that the laws of the Medes and the Persians were actually based on the educational understanding of the Magi. Now, what's interesting is that history actually tells us is that no person could become the king of Persia unless they were educated by the Magi and passed the test and they approved and they would actually be the ones that would place the crown on the head of the king. And so you could see why King Herod would be concerned because this is the group of people who decides who gets to be king in the country they come from. When it says King Herod was disturbed, that's why. And then it said, and all Jerusalem with him, because if you know anything about King Herod, if he was disturbed, he made life a living nightmare for everyone else. And everyone else became very disturbed. So there's, an, there's a person in the Old Testament, very prominent, one of the most uh, gifted leaders in all of Scripture. His name was Daniel. And uh, as a young man, he'd been taken captive as a Jew to Babylon, where he was trained he was intellectually brilliant. He was spiritually sensitive. And he had been trained under the system of magi. And there came an order from the king that, that all of the magi, all of the wise men of the country, needed to identify the dream the king had and interpret it for him. And they said, we can't do it. And so the king ordered the execution of all the magi. And when Daniel heard about this, he asked for a reprieve so that he could seek God, and God showed him what the dream was and the interpretation of it, and he went back to the king and gave it to him, but he asked for all the lives of the Magi to be spared, and that's why all the wise men in that kingdom had a special affinity to Daniel, and it makes sense that they would have then had access not only to his prophetic understanding, but the scriptures which guided his life. So Numbers chapter 24, when it talked about that there would be a star that would rise and it would signal the birth of a king that would shepherd the nation of Israel, that they would have become aware of that. When they saw this anomaly in the heaven, they started to put two and two together and they decided that they would at least check it out. They weren't certain if it was true, but they wanted to find out if it was true. So they planned for a long journey, and they gathered lots of provisions, and they, they, they walked away from their city and out of their country. And the goal was to find out if this king was real. We actually have an example of another person in the story who had access to similar information, took a very different route, and that's King Herod. King Herod had been exposed to the information from the wise man and scriptural support from the chief priest of the, of the people of Israel at that time. And so this is what he says. He said, you go and search carefully. He doesn't go. He just said, you do it. He's not going to take any initiative. He might have an opinion about it. He might be interested in it. But he's not going to do anything because his life is so busy and he has so many other important things to do. Second thing he tells, says is, report to me. Now, that's a position where you are reminding people what your authority is and what their responsibility is to you. you know? I would like to hear more about that as one thing. Report to me. Very different statement. And then he says, I may go and worship. The key word there is may. It's something I may choose based on the information that I receive. And of course, we know he actually has a hidden agenda in all of this. But he doesn't commit himself to worship. This brings us to an understanding of, of three very important truths about wise people who are taking initiative. And I'm going to take most of my time on the first point, 
Uh, I'm not going to take so much time on points two and three, so if I'm working through point one and you see the clock getting by and you think that you're going to miss Christmas because I'm going to talk, <laughs> that's, that's not how it is. Wise people do not try to be their own king. Our world actually tells us that that's the definition of freedom. If you can call all the shots and you can decide what matters, that's what freedom is. That's what autonomy is. Uh, the problem is, is that when left to our own devices, the decisions that we make tend to be based on what makes us comfortable rather than what really matters. And we tend to focus on things that provide pleasure rather than fulfillment. Every one of our hearts crave a fulfilling life, but we'll settle for way less than that a lot of times. And so any parent knows that if you have little children, you can't leave them unobserved or unattended for any length of time. Why? Because they will eat stuff that tastes good but is not good for them. They will have cookies and candy for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and dessert. And they will love every minute of it while they're throwing it up and while their teeth are rotting out of their heads. You know, we just know. Parents need to be there because they don't make... How many have, how many have as, as children... You, you remember your children, they didn't want to go to bed. Did, did anybody, kids beside our kids, just fight us on going to bed? Just my kids, oh well. <laughs> well, they did, you know. And, and now, now I look at them and I go, I wish someone would tell me, go take a nap. You know, <laughs> go to bed, that would be so good. Why is it we're tempted to assume that when we reach a certain height or a certain age, age that we don't need someone else to speak into our life anymore. We don't make our best decisions when left to our own devices. So the Magi are seeking a king, a king that's going to give them a sense of direction, a sense of value, a sense of worth. And they understand something. Life doesn't just work automatically because you were born into it. That there are lots of them. My, my wife was uh, uh, working, and she got home from work yesterday. She told me the story. There was a young person, 13 years old, who came into the store, introduced themselves with a, brag, uh, with a broad smile and a handshake. 13-year-old walked up, said, hello, my name is, and uh, Sue said, well, my name is, he, he, he said, I know your name. I see your picture up there. That's a nice picture. And, and Sue said, how old are you? And he, he said, 13. She said, that picture was taken before you were born. <laughs> That's why that picture was taken. And th then he says, someday I want to work for this store. I want to be an employee of this company. And so she starts looking around to see if the manager is there. Now, she knows he's only 13, and thanks to child labor laws, we don't actually employ people at that age. But she told him, you know, at 15, he said, oh, I know, I've already checked it out, and at 15, I'm going to be right back here. She was looking for ways to connect him to people to get the job. Why? Because that's how it really works. If you just stay home, the company's not going to call you. If you come in all sulky and corners of your mouth down, looking at the ground, mumbling, she might offer you medication. Not much else. Not much else. There's a way the world actually works. There's a way to forge healthy relationships so that we can endure difficulty. There's a way to be competent in this world. There's, there's a way to build a family where values are imparted and individuals are supported. There's a way to manage our resources so when we make a single bad decision or there's an economic downturn, we're not destroyed by it. There's a way to speak truth in love. It's amazing how many people call themselves truth speakers when all they do is just bash people about with a kind of venom that's unbelievable or other people who will never speak truth for the fear of hurting someone's feelings. And we have to learn to speak truth and love. And these skills and these abilities, they do not come down the chimney to us on Christmas Day. You have to seek someone who can speak into your life. You need a king. It can't be you. Now, the Magi have prepared, and they've traveled a long distance, 
and they didn't just wonder about it. They didn't just have opinions. They actually took the initiative and they went to see for themselves. And they couldn't tell on the front end of their journey how long this would take or how much it would cost, but they courageously pursued to find out for themselves if it was true. I would like to suggest to you today that I don't know how long your journey in pursuit of truth or learning skills in life will be or how much it will cost, but if you are courageous and if you are humble, it will make a difference. Not just in your life, but the life of everyone you know. Jesus insisted that if we sought truth, that that is how we experience real freedom. And he said, if you seek truth, you will always find it. But we have to take initiative. We have to seek the truth. Uh, could there be ways to treat others that actually benefits everyone rather than just someone always being taken advantage of? Yes. Could there be ways to build relationships that make each other healthier and stronger? Yes. Could there be ways to manage your resources so that not only are you able to provide for unforeseen circumstances, but can actually contribute generous, generously towards others so that you can help them? Yes. I, could there be ways to actually harness and manage your anger so that it doesn't destroy people, but that it actually helps get something important done? Yes. Could there be ways to live your life sexually so that it doesn't expose you to unnecessary disease, create unwanted life, or generate unbearable regret? Yes. Yes, there is. But you won't stumble on this kind of information. You have to seek it out. You have to learn. That's why we gather and study God's word. Right now, you are taking initiative. You've come to this place where we can learn about God and what motivates his actions towards us. We gather and we take time to talk to each other and pray for each other. We have life groups so that you can be known and know each other so that you can celebrate others and they can celebrate stuff that's happening in your life. We exercise generosity because we honestly believe that what is going to happen is even greater than anything that has happened or is happening. Every time we get together, we're taking initiative. Now, that was point one, so now you know the next two are going to go fast. <laughs> Wise people do not live as if there is no king. Wise people don't want to be their own king, but they don't live as if there is no king because that amplifies apathy. It just sur you surrender to the forces of our world that determine what you react to. In fact, a lot of injustice in our world happens because someone believes that no one will ever hold them accountable. Terrible things happen when there is no king. And what winds up happening is we just flow along in life, being directed by every other force that, that comes into our lives. And that's no way to live. Wise people do not live as if there is no king, but wise people do seek the true king. What is true is that God watched our world while it was breaking down and falling apart, and it broke his heart. And he could have turned away and just left us to our own devices, but he doesn't. What does he do? He takes the initiative. He formed a plan to redeem and restore fallen humanity, and he broke into our world with the cries of a baby, and he showed us what life could be like if we are willing to live it on his terms. He paid the price so that all of our failures and all of our faults, all of our unwise actions, all of our words, all of our attitudes could be forever forgiven. And if that weren't enough, he actually offers free gifts, gifts of forgiveness, gifts of guidance, gifts of eternal life. And here's what the tendency is when we hear about this. We just go, well, if it's supposed to happen to me, then it'll happen to me. I'll just kind of sit here and wait for it. Don't be like King Herod. Let other people search. Let them report to me. I'll decide if I'll do anything. You have to take initiative. You can't create eternal life or eternal forgiveness but you can take the initiative to pursue the truth about how that makes a difference in our world and in your life. You can do that. All it took was a star and a scripture 
And the wise men set off on a journey to find out for themselves. And we have so much more than those two things. And I would just encourage you, take the initiative to receive the gift that God offers to you. Let's bow our heads today. Um, to be sure, these are challenging times, and we're exposed to all kinds of information. And some of it can be uh, fairly demeaning of ideas about God or grace. So how do you know what information is worth pursuing or not? And here's a test I'd like you to think through. Not just what does it claim, that's important, but what does it accomplish? And you can actually look into the eyes of individuals who have decided that they will begin this journey and they don't know how long it will take and they don't know how much it will cost, but they want to find out for themselves if there is a God in heaven and if he did give his son and if these gifts are available at his cost. And what I've discovered is that people who are on that journey and discovering that truth for themselves, the fractured parts of their heart start getting whole. They find ways to relate with others that actually make relationships healthier and stronger. The families become a place of joy instead of unbearable memories. And that they make a difference in the world. I'm not asking you just to accept King Jesus because of his claims. I want you to consider his claims and then I want you to take a look at the response that happens in the lives of those who pursue him. And it's way better than living as your own king and it's way better than living as no king. It makes all the difference when you find the true king. So Father, today we seek you. We seek your wisdom, we seek your counsel, we seek your guidance. We're not just going to passively sit back and let life happen. We're going to engage. We're going to show up in rooms like this and war against the kind of passivity that would cause our life to drift and disintegrate. Help us find you and the truth that you give to us that helps every part of our life become whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.